filmmaker, explorer, inventor, all around popular mechanics guy, uh, Mr. James Cameron. Um, for me, in my career, this is a special treat because I've, uh, my career has straddled science and technology reporting, uh, entertainment reporting. I've worked on Entertainment Magazine and a, a deep love of, of both film and technology, which come together in the films of James Cameron like no place else. So uh, there, there's a, a lot we could talk about. We'll get into a little bit of one-on-one of -on -one, uh, Q&A and, um, and then open the floor up to questions. So, um, uh, uh, Jim, I wanted to start off with something we had mentioned earlier a little bit, but I wanted to go into a little bit more depth, and that is, I notice when I talk to scientists and engineers, including probably a lot of people in this room, the, um, uh, almost everybody was inspired at some point mm. by a science fiction novel or, or a movie or both that, that opened up their uh, sense of curiosity and possibility and, and encouraged them to pursue um, uh, this line of work. So for you, what, uh, what were your early inspirations? What got you started down this road? Well, I've just always been really, really curious about everything. And science fiction was a way to exercise m the muscles of my imagination, thinking about what the boundaries of the possible were. I wasn't interested in fantasy in the sense of, of fantasy literature, you know, witches and warlocks and elves and all that, because to me there was, there was no sense of where that boundary line really was. Mm -hmm. But in science fiction, it played by the rules of, you know, the the laws of physics and what things might be possible at, at, you know, at some distant future time or on some other planet. And so it, it, it allowed me to take what I was learning in science class and doing a lot of voracious reading on my own, apply, it, apply that knowledge back to my, to my entertainment. You know, so for me, it was just about living in that, in that world of, of imagination as a kid. And I think you're right. I mean, I, I've talked to a lot of, uh, a lot of space scientists, uh, for example, who grew up on a diet of science fiction as right. well. Of course, now we live in a science fiction age, <laughs> you know, that's almost indistinguishable from the things that I, I read about as a kid. Of course, we don't have interstellar travel yet, but uh, Check back. I, I, I hope somebody's, issue, I hope right? somebody's working on that. But. <laughs> well, now, you know, if you can get a subatomic particle to tra travel faster than the speed of light, maybe, uh, maybe it's not as far off as, uh, as we thought. Let's confirm that <laughs> first, before we get all, get all excited. It does come down to some pretty precise measurement that might have yeah, been right, a little bit right. off. Um, any particular standouts for you as when you were young? In terms of direct influences, well, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey was a real mind blower for me because, and I think it was for a lot of people, uh, it, it was such a quantum leap in terms of, of uh, visualization of what I think of as the internal Im uh, imagination onto the screen. And uh, it really just leapfrogged over, over 10 years of, of development of, of cinematic technique with, with one film. And it was, it was the point where uh, I wanted to know how films were made. I, I sort of hadn't really been paying attention. I was a fan of, of, of uh, movies and, and science fiction and films and fantasy films and so on, but that was the point at which I really wanted to know how they had done that. And so I actually started at the, at the age then of, of 14 or 15 to read about how films were made, how cameras worked, how visual effects were done, and so on. And so it was really the first, I traced that back to the, as the first step toward actually becoming a practitioner in, mm -hmm. in film years later. You know, we were talking earlier about, you know, it's tempting sometimes for people who are visual artists to say, well, I don't really care about the technology, don't, don't, don't get too involved, I don't want to get too involved in, in that, because that might be some kind of a barrier between me and what I want to say, and you've always taken very much sure. the opposite approach. Well, I think it's really unrealistic if you're, if you're a filmmaker. I think if you're, an, if you're a novelist, it doesn't matter if you, if you can even operate your, your microwave, you know, but I think that if you're a filmmaker, you have to embrace the fact that you're working in a technical medium. It's not a pure art form in the sense of, of writing a novel or, or, or painting, painting a painting. It's a technical art form. It's always been a technical art form. The, the first visual effects filmmaker was the first filmmaker, Georges Méliès. Uh, he was doing visual effects. He was doing them in camera. He was doing a lot of trompe l'oeil and, and big painted cutouts and things like that. But that was the state of the art of visual effects at that time, and he was, he was doing it. He was using miniatures and special makeup and all kinds of things. So visual effects was born essentially at the same moment cinema was born, and they've progressed together. It's always been a technical medium. Even if you're just doing an independent film with two people talking you know, on the subway or something, you're still shooting with a, with a camera. Uh, which uh, you, you have to stay abreast of lens technology and, and camera technology in order to create the image. That's your, that's your paintbrush. So I, it's never seemed to me to be two separate camps. I know that there's this, 
there's this sense uh, uh, in Hollywood that there are serious films made by people who are humanist filmmakers who are primarily concerned with the human condition and, and emotions and real things, real grown-up things. And then there are the kind of you know, mainstream you know, Hollywood popcorn movies. And to, to me, that, that line or that divide has never, never really existed. And by the way, I would submit that technology is part of the human condition. We are sitting in a beautiful LEED certified building like this with this, what do you call it, Diagos? Diagrid. Yeah, di Diagrid. Yeah. Um, you know, this, is, this, is, uh, this whole city is, is a, uh, you know, a tribute to, to the, the technical imagination of the human species. And you cannot separate us from our technology. We could, none of us in this room probably, uh, and, and put up your hand if you could, uh, could just go and live completely off the grid, grow your own, grow your own vegetables and use zero technology like, like the Amish, for example. We wouldn't know how to do that. We, we live inextricably interwoven with our technology and our future uh, survival will be determined by our technology and our innovation. It's too late for us to just say, you know, enough of this whole technology experiment. Let's not do that anymore. Um, let's try to live much more simply. We can't do that. It's not possible for us. There's too many people on the planet. We've exceeded the sort of the natural sustainable boundaries of the planet. And we're going to have to think of some pretty neat hat tricks in order to continue to survive. You know, it's interesting. A previous uh, winner of the Breakthrough Leadership Award, Amory Lovins from Rocky Mountain Institute, yeah, one of the great um, uh, environmental uh, uh, engineers and advocates for sustainability. Mm -hmm. And we had this conversation. And he made the same point that the that uh, the, the, the technology of human life is, is inescapable and the sort of Rousseauian fantasy of everybody going back to the woods is not, yeah. the planet would maybe sustain a population of, of, of a few tens of millions at most uh, yeah. if we tried to have that kind of lifestyle. So we're all dependent on technology. You know, our magazine's certainly devoted to helping people understand it, even things that you don't need to fix like your iPhone, but we, our readers still want to understand how it works. And, um, and you're on the verge of putting yourself in a situation where uh, you're about as dependent on your technology in a very minute-to-minute -minute sense as you possibly can be, working on this project to uh, build a submersible that will go down to the, the deepest point in the ocean and, and, and really uh, help initiate a new era of deep, deep sea exploration. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think I'm the classic kid who read Popular Mechanics and then grew up you know, to be a popular mechanics geek. I mean, I was programmed by that. I mean, there's, there's the cover always had the most amazing advance in technology. And then by the time you got to the back pages, it was how to build a, a shelf or right. something. You know what I mean? We still, but that's still our formula. It's still, it's still the formula. <laughs> so what does that program you to think? You can do it. You can build it yourself. You can pick up a screwdriver and tinker it together. And you know, uh, Vince, Vince Pace, who's, who's my partner in the, the Cameron Pace group, we build, uh, he's right back there. We build uh, uh, 3D cameras together. These are the most advanced imaging systems available for, for entertainment uh, on the planet. But you know, we both come from that same attitude that, that uh, uh, you know, his, his dad was a, was a uh, uh, machinist and he's a machinist. I was a machinist in college. You know, we just want to build stuff. So that translates to if, if I want to go do exploration, I'm going to build the things, you know. Mm -hmm. So right now we're building a sub, not, not with Vince, this is being done with some engineers down in, uh, down in Sydney, Australia. We're building a sub, we've been working on it for about six years to go to the bottom of the, of the deepest trenches in the world's oceans, uh, specifically the uh, Challenger Deep, which is part of the Mariana Trench system, uh, Tonga Trench, uh, Kermadec Trench which are all in the, the western, western Pacific. And we're talking you know, 36,000 feet of depth, about 16,500 pounds per square inch of pressure. So, so the, the, the systems, even the, some of the materials uh, to be able to, to realize such a vehicle didn't exist. That's what took six years. We had to do, we had to do uh, quite a fair bit of research and development into, into the actual materials that were gonna be used to create the pressure boundary, the hull, the sphere that you, that you sit inside and the flotation system. Uh, you know, which I could geek out on for, for quite a while. But, but uh, anyway, it's been, a, it's been a fascinating and, and, and very challenging project, and it's coming to fruition. The sub is coming together now. We're going to be diving it uh, early next year. Now, we have, earlier at lunch we were talking about this, and you mentioned that, you know, thousands of people have been down to the floor of the ocean. The hard part's coming back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> people have been going to the bottom of the ocean for 10,000 years, <laughs> you know. It's just a one-way trip most of the time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, getting back to the tricky bit. 
you know, and it's, it's actually quite challenging to, to work at those depths. I've done a lot of dives to, uh, um, you know, the ocean diving sort of goes in various classifications. There's kind of uh, ambient pressure diving where you're actually feeling the pressure. And a lot of people get confused about this. They always ask me, well, if you go in a, in a sub that deep, how long do you decompress? Well, like, no, that's, that's, that's one atmosphere diving where, where inside the sub you're at the same pressure that we're at right now. Um, and that's what the sub does. Sub protects you from the pressure. So ambient pressure diving, you can go down. I mean, the deepest human beings have gone and actually felt the squeeze of the, of the ocean's pressures, maybe 1,000 feet in pressure chambers in laboratory tests down to 2,500 feet. This is not very deep by, by submersible diving uh, uh, standards. So, and then there's sort of two classifications after that, 1,000 meter which is where some of the more sort of tourist class uh, bubble subs that you may have seen sometimes on the cover of uh, Popular Mechanics, and then 6,000 meters. That's been traditionally the sort of boundary because with a 6,000 meter sub, you can access about 97 to 98% of the ocean's depths. But there are these interesting trenches that go from, from 6,000 meters down to as deep as 11,000 meters. Almost nothing is known about them, and they're subduction zones where one, one uh, plate, one crustal plate, is grinding underneath another. And it's actually creating this, this, uh, these anomalous, extremely deep places uh, in the ocean. So you've got the Puerto Rico Trench. You've got a number of trenches around the world, including the ones I, I mentioned earlier. And very, very little is known about them. Um, and not, and uh, the subduction process needs to be understood better. Uh, obviously, if we, if we understood it perfectly and we could predict when, when one of these major you know, thrust faults is going to is going to slip. We could we could uh, uh, have a better tsunami warning system. We might not have disasters uh, as bad as what we had in in Japan recently or Indonesia a few years ago. Um, and that's where these that's where these horrific you know catastrophic events uh, originate. So we need to understand a lot more about what's happening down in these deepest places. And of course, the biologists need a whole lot more information about the endemic populations down in these trenches. So the one thing I, I know for sure is on the first dive and any other dive that we make, we will find species that haven't been seen before. We'll discover something new. And that's exciting. And you've spent quite a bit of time um, in, the, in the deep ocean environment, uh, and including um, a number of documentaries, um, and including at the, uh, the mid-ocean ridge vents where mm -hmm. you have these fascinating populations of exotic um, organisms unlike anything we see um, on the surface. The um, Popular Mechanics did a cover story several years ago about the search for extraterrestrial life right. that focused primarily on what we've learned about uh, these extremophiles mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. the different organisms that have evolved to live in places like these hot water vents and what they tell us about what might be possible in extreme uh, environments in other parts of the solar system. Well, and then when I saw Avatar, I, I saw uh, a lot of the vision of the biology of that planet was shaped, seemed to me to be, have been shaped uh, partly by, uh, by the marine environment. What, can you tell us a little bit about what your thinking was in creating that imaginary world? Yeah, I mean, Avatar, Avatar's uh, uh, rainforest and its fauna were clearly inspired by underwater motifs, and, and a lot of them are recognizable from the Christmas tree worms the Christmas that, are, trees, yeah. that are, you know, any diver, even a snorkeler would recognize. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're only this big. In Avatar, they were two or three meters across. Uh, and so on, and not in the water, you know. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just changing, changing the scale, uh, or, or changing the environment, uh, made made things that we recognize from this planet seem alien and, and strange and exotic. You know, my feeling is that the that every inspiration one could ever have for for alien life is already here on Earth somewhere in, in the in the vast diversity, uh, and and certainly a lot of that is uh, is in the oceans. Um, I, we drew a little bit on the hydrothermal vent communities, not that much. It was mostly for me coral reef fish, the, the bright colors of, uh, of coral reef fish and some uh, nudibranchs and some of the other invertebrates that are so brightly colored and that kind of profusion of, uh, of, uh, of color and design uh, that you know, I, I had seen for so many years. I've been a diver since I was 16. That's going back to when you know, I used to ride my pet triceratops to school. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, so I've, I've dived probably, a, I've dived about 3,000 hours on scuba, about 500 in subs and 500 in dive helmets. So I've seen a lot of pretty strange looking critters mm -hmm. and just inspired by that. And, you know, the thing about Avatar that's kind of interesting is the goal of the film was to uh, inspire people, especially kids, to, to think differently about nature and our interconnectedness with it. 
Um, but sometimes you've got to depoliticize the, the dialogue, you know, and by going to another planet and celebrating an alien ecosystem, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, everybody made the cognitive connection that I was really talking about, about planet Earth and how valuable it is to us, uh, you know, aesthetically and in, and in terms of, of our interdependence on those, on those uh, systems. Um, and I think people were able to close that loop and get mm -hmm. it. But sometimes mm -hmm. you've got to, science fiction is a great mirror to hold up either to the human condition or to our relationship to technology and or our relationship to nature. Um, and, and of course, the relationship of our technology to nature, which is usually, you know, pretty much a one-way street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, I, I don't know if everybody in the room knows, you're working on the, the scripts to Avatar 2 and Avatar 3. Right. Are there any particular inspirations we're going to see in those uh, in those films uh, from your from your other work, uh, well, you know, I mean, I think my, my I'm fairly I'm fairly consistent thematically mm -hmm. in, in in my films in, in dealing you know when I when I do science fiction it's it's generally of a, a sort of dystopian nature here are the here are the warnings mm -hmm. this is where there are warnings from technology and our dependence on it uh, you know we saw that in uh, in Aliens they overdepended on technology but at the same time uh, you know Sigourney's character saves herself with technology at the end of the film. So it's all about our relationship, how we use it wisely, how we use it unwisely, and commenting on that. So I'm going to continue with those, with those themes. I think that, you know, Avatar was, was, I think, ultimately successful because there was an integration of, of the entertainment value and, the, and the, the message value of the film. I don't think as many people would have gone to see it opening day if they thought it was an environmental film. I think it had to be in the marketplace, and, and people had to understand what it was for a while for them to, to accept the idea that it could be an entertaining mm -hmm. environmental film because there really wasn't such a thing. You have documentaries, but you don't have entertainment, entertainment films. So I, I'm going to have to be careful with the second and third film to make sure that, the, that um, it doesn't become you know, kind of a, a strident, strident mm -hmm. soapbox to talk about things that I think are important, but it maintains its, its, uh, its integrity as a piece of entertainment and, and visual imagination. And my goal with making the first film, one of the goals, was to create what I think of as a, a waking dream state for the audience. That's what the 3D was all about. That's what the two years of design was all about. That's what the, uh, uh, the CG um, production methodology, the, the virtual production methodology with performance capture, mm -hmm. was all about, to do something that, that was uh, compelling to watch vis visually in a very transporting way. So the key to the second and third films will be to, to maintain that that level of, uh, of visual creativity. And to do that, I have to rely on my team of artists because you know, we had some of the top, top designers, uh, film designers, creature designers, and so on in the world working on the film. And, and you know, I have to have a, uh, I'll, I'll put the same team back together. Right, right, you know, yeah. Because we well, have a shorthand now, obviously. <laughs> so the, um, you know, ob obviously the 3D demo dimension of that film was, was critical to the, uh, the entire effect, but I know that that you've done a lot of, of uh, work uh, before and after Avatar in, in 3D technology. Um, Vince Pace, who works with mm -hmm. you and Cameron Pace, which is uh, developing a lot of this technology, has a bunch of patents and more on the way. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think a lot of people, if you see 3D primarily as a, uh, an entertainment um, medium, it really goes far beyond that. And, and can you talk to us a little bit about why you feel that uh, stereoscopic vision is so important in a lot of different areas, including mm -hmm. science. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I mean, the thing is that, that the history of entertainment presentation technology, display technology, has really been greater and greater alignment between the, w the way the human sensory system works and the way the entertainment's presented. So it started off with a small square screen with no sound in black and white. Well, we don't see that way. You know, we see in color, we hear, we hear spatially. Um, so these are all the developments as we went to color, then we went to widescreen. Um, obviously, I, I skipped sound. We went to mono sound and then stereophonic sound. Now we're up to, to uh, you know, six-track sound, which, which replicates our, our spatial awareness through, through sound and so on. And of course, we see in 3D. So there have been technical hurdles preventing us from converting our entertainment or tr transforming our entertainment to, to 3D along the way. But in the last decade, all of those hurdles have fallen. Uh, mostly because of advances in digital technology, uh, display systems, uh, you know, LCDs and so on, that make it possible to display 3D at high frame rates, which is what's necessary for us to, to be able to see it. 
and in movie theaters, uh, you know, the, the DLP uh, technology, uh, camera technology, uh, uh, digital cameras, which allow us to put two cameras together either into a beam splitter rig or a side-by-side -side rig to simulate uh, human vision. And we've become, we've gotten very, very sophisticated over the last few years in how we manage the stereo space at the moment that we, that we acquire it so the viewer is having a, a good experience and so that you can cut one shot to another. There was a time even as recently as six or seven years ago where there were experts, real bona fide experts who got paid a lot of money to be kind of gurus of 3D that said you couldn't make a 3D movie because uh, if you were to do a close-up of somebody, it would be, a, it would be an edge violation there, where their body connected with the edge of the screen, they would, there, there would be an, a, 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 a paradox where they would appear to be uh, cut off. They would be floating in space, but they'd be cut off, and this would be very disturbing to people. Of course, when Vince and I started working with, with 3D, we just, we put our first, we just tinkered it together. It's the popular mechanic way of doing business. We just slammed a couple of HD cameras side by side and started working with it and feeding out a live signal to, to 3D projection. We set up two digital projectors, two cameras, and we started experimenting. And guess what? We found out that you could make a movie. You could control the stereo space in such a way that it wasn't bothersome and that most of those old rules of stereography didn't apply. And so we went from thinking that we were going to be doing this technology just for the few 3D theaters that were extant at the time, this is, you know, 10 years ago, it was just a handful of IMAX 3D theaters. There was no widespread platform. It, there was a moment where the light bulb began to glow in about 2002 that the technology was just over the horizon to convert all movie theaters to 3D. And that got really exciting because, from you know, I, I think Vince and I both suffer from the same curse, which is once we visualize something and we know we can build it, we have to build it. And then we have we have to make it come yeah. true, yeah. and I think that that that's you know that's one of the things if I can if I can plug the magazine a little bit is that people who who read Popular Mechanics they're not they their imaginations are are stimulated and and to some extent catalyzed I'm sure by seeing what other people are doing hands on, and very, whether whether they act on it or whether they just go out in the garage and and, and pick up the the cordless drill and, and knock something together or go work on their car. They're popular mechanics people are hands-on people, they're doers. You know, th these are the people that actually make things happen in, in engineering and technology, I think. It's not a, not a bunch of theory. Right, right. And what, what the big philosophy of our magazine is that that hands-on experience also makes you more interested in the theory. That's and, right. And the same person who's building a bookshelf is also interested in, you know, um, what comes next after the space shuttle and how should we, how should sure. we improve on that. Exactly. And so. an appreciation for the difficulty of of doing engineering, especially of complex systems mm -hmm. like like vehicles, whether it's underwater vehicles or space vehicles. Uh, Mike Mike uh, Ravine is here, who uh, sucked me into working on the uh, on the Curiosity rover. Mm -hmm. I think he's even got a he's even got a camera here. That, that's they took it away. They, took it away. <laughs> they rest. They, they tackled you at the, in the lobby. The security guys. Anyway, so I've been involved in in some some incredibly complex projects, mm -hmm. and I don't think anything's more complex than the than the Curiosity uh, rover mission, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just in terms of, of the, the amount of work, time, energy, money, you know, resources that, that went into this vehicle. Uh, it's going to be a pretty amazing piece of, uh, piece of science uh, exploration yeah, uh, yeah. equipment. Uh, for those who don't know, we're one, of, one of the awards tonight will be what we call the Mechanical Lifetime Achievement uh, Award that will go to Spirit and Opportunity, the two, the two current uh, rovers. But let's talk oh, a little bit. And uh, they are the precursors. They're the precursors the, to curiosity, you know, yes. And you can, uh, you can see the through line, the, 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 the tech, technological pedigree mm -hmm. uh, you know, that started, started off with the little Sojourner uh, uh, technology demonstrator that mm -hmm. flew on Pathfinder in 98. And, uh, and then you know, the, the same rocker bogey wheel mechanism was then used very, very successfully with, with Spirit and Opportunity, who yeah. are still operating, really, mm -hmm. I think. I Opportunity think one of them, is one still. Of them, one of them's dead, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but you know, a seven-year mission that mm -hmm. just returned untold um, amounts of, of science data, and then you know the Curiosity rover, which is uh, you know I think in mass ten times the size of the mm -hmm. of the uh, MER rovers, yeah. uh, and nuclear nuclear powered, uh, you know, which should have a long a long life uh, of investigation on the planet. Let's, let's talk a little bit about space because uh, we, we were talking downstairs about the, the retirement of the space shuttle and, and the frustration that uh, I think some of us have, including uh, both of us, that, that as beautiful and elegant as the shuttle was, as noble an experiment as it might have been, it was also uh, a program that wound up, up um, 
running far too long and soaking up resources that could have gone into more ambitious, genuine space exploration. So, uh, where do you? Well, it was never a machine for, for exploration. And it was, you know, I mean, we human human beings haven't been out of low Earth orbit since since uh, uh, you know Apollo 17 and, and uh, uh, what was it 72. Mm -hmm. So you know we're coming up on on our 40 year anniversary of going nowhere fast. And I call it going nowhere fast because to stay in Earth orbit you've got to go 17,000 some miles per hour to stay in low Earth orbit about 220 nautical miles up, which is where the space station is and where the shuttle you know its flight regime was. The shuttle was never capable of going beyond that. And so we just got we just got kind of stuck in our backyard for, for the last thirty years because, you know, we had we had to build we had to build a reusable spacecraft. We couldn't keep throwing away these big expensive Saturn Vs. Well of course it turns out that, that in, uh, from a from a cost benefit analysis, Saturn Vs are way cheaper to to launch a pound of payload than uh, than the space shuttle. But we had to have reusability. But the dream of reusability was always a uh, was always a fantasy. It never really uh, was realized because the, the shuttle required so much refurbishment between missions that the, the human human resources costs were just so high. Uh, so we just got we got stuck. Oh, and then and then you know we've got this space shuttle. And we don't want to look like idiots. We've got to have something to shuttle to because the shuttle implies you're going to shuttle back and forth. That's <laughs> what it means, right. right? So now we better build a space station to justify the, the space shuttle. And uh, you know and and this has been this has been likened to going, Columbus going to Queen Isabella and saying, um, we're going to go to North America, but first what I want to do is put some guys in a ship offshore about a mile and study the effects of being on a ship for about 30 years. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's not how, how the, f the future, the, you know, the, the, this, entire, this entire country, this, this nation, this continent was was opened up by those early explorers who, who went out of sight of land and didn't look back. So um, another award tonight will be to SpaceX, the pioneering private space company, one of a number of really exciting companies that are pushing this new frontier, and in partnership with NASA. Yeah. Um, uh, do you think that's the answer? Do you think we're going to make some headway now a little more quickly than we have in the last 30 years? Well, that would be damning with faint praise to say <laughs> we're moving quicker than the last 30 years. No, I mean, I, look, I think uh, Elon Musk has got his eye on the prize. He believes that we should be a spacefaring sp species and a spacefaring nation, and we should be. Uh, and we're not as long as we're, as we're circling around in low Earth orbit. So he's going to, you know, he's he, he believes we should be colonizing Mars. He doesn't believe we should be landing on Mars and planting a flag. He believes we should be colonizing Mars, and he has taken that dream and turned it into a reality with, with one of the uh, it's the biggest and, and best run of the of the. Uh, um, and successful with, with huge amounts of launch contracts uh, in the billions of dollars um, uh, of, these, of these space startups. You know, He basically said, we're going to build rockets. We're going to build old school rockets, but we're just going to use what we know about modern, modern technology, materials, development systems to do it, to do it better and to make it reusable uh, so that it is cost effective. But his idea of reusability is you know, a, a, a rocket that can launch a payload to orbit, come back down, land on its, land on its tail, be refueled, and go again the same day. Yeah, and it's um, and he'll do it, it too. and they're making some some very impressive headway. So uh, it's uh, it's interesting, you know, that that you know, there was so much made about about you know uh, Bert Rutan, Spaceship One, and all that, and it's in the Smithsonian, and mm, but you know, I mean, it was a it was a sixty mile high suborbital flight with with absolutely zero purpose other than just having some fun and weightlessness and showing what what. Uh, what composite materials can do. You know, I mean, I respect it. I respect the accomplishment. But at the same time, Elon Musk comes along and flies the, the Dragon space capsule, which is capable of carrying seven people to orbit. He flew it. He orbited it twice, which requires 10 times the, the amount of energy as a suborbital flight. And he brought it back, and he landed it within a mile of where he said he was going to in the ocean. And, and nobody noticed. N you know, I mean, it was, it was barely, a, barely an, uh, a blip from the meteor radar. And it's well, just it's how, it's up, but it is on the cover of Popular Mechanics. It is now. <laughs> it is now. And, and, I, and this is my way of, of, of you know, tipping, tipping my hat to you guys for actually telling that, telling that story. So now it'll be on the, now it'll be on the cover on, on the magazine stands, and people can't ignore it. But you know, this is a guy. This is a guy that, that's living the entrepreneurial dream of, of exploration. So, so you've been to um, some very deep places in the ocean. You've been to remote uh, rainforests. Uh, uh, you've done a lot of exciting things. Will you be in space? 
Well, I, I, look, I'd, I'd love to. You know, I mean, I think people have to, uh, they have to do things for the right reasons, and to just sort of go for fun uh, is not something I've ever really been interested in. I, I, uh, I went to Moscow in, in 2000, and I went through the whole pre-cosmonaut training thing, the centrifuge and all the biomedical stuff, because I was going to go to the Mir space station. I was going to take our 3D camera system and make a film about uh, living and working in, in long-duration space flight. Uh, I would still be very interested in that because that's the key to understanding how we're going to to live beyond the Earth for, for long periods of time. You're not going to go to Mars in an afternoon. You know, it's going to take you maybe, uh, it could be as long as two and a half year trip depending on exactly what type of trajectory you use and how much time you spend on the surface of the planet. So there's a lot that needs to be needs to be understood ab about that by the public. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I wanted to extol the virtues of, of space stations for understanding, but as a stepping stone to these, these other things. So the short answer is, yeah, I'd love to go, but only, only to make a film, not to be a tourist. Mm -hmm.